This is I Hear Things for Friday, August 13th, 2021. It's Friday the 13th. I hope you're not a superstitious person. If you are, then this podcast will be bad luck for you, and I don't I don't want that for you. Uh, on this episode, I'm going to talk about the most important, or at least the most frequently asked question in podcasting. It's, it's the one that I hear most often, and the one that I see most often in, in things like the uh, podcast movement, Facebook group, and uh, other online fora. I hear this asked a lot, so I'm going to address it. And I'll get to that in just a moment. But first, a little bit of a bonus. Here it is, folks. This is it. This is the list that you have been waiting for, the official updated list of the most powerful people in podcasting. Now, I'm told that list posts or listicles are just magnets for clicks and downloads. So I have set the entire team here at I Hear Things headquarters towards the single purpose of constructing the one list, the list to rule them all. And here it is, the most powerful people in podcasting. Number one, the audience. Okay, that's the end of the list. Uh, in truth, the list of influential people in podcasting changes every single year, and it changes because the audience changes. And with that, the fortunes and careers of us all rise and fall. The audience wills it to be so. The audience giveth, and the audience taketh away. They can respond to your best effort to catch them, sometimes with gratitude and sometimes with, eh, thanks, but uh, we're over here now, so... Yeah, cool. You can never fully predict the constantly changing tastes of an audience. You can only improve your odds, and you can try to take a better educated stab than your competitors do. It's a constant process of adaptation, and I talk about adaptation a lot. It's why this podcast is about podcasting and not about LimeWire or Napster. We're all adapting, and the audience is the existential question for every podcaster who's trying to adapt. Last week, I gave the opening keynote at Podcast Movement in Nashville, and I talked about this, the most asked question in all of podcasting. It's the one that I have seen uh, over one November decillion times. You can look that up. It's about 60 zeros in the Podcast Movement Facebook group. How do I grow my audience? And there are, of course, many ways to spur audience growth. There's cross-promotion, which is certainly extremely effective. There's targeted ads. I know people that have had very good luck buying ads, especially in podcast apps. There's SEO, transcripts, blogging, all of the things to improve the searchability of your show. And all of these things work to varying degrees to help you grow your audience. But my point to the folks that ask that and to you is this. How do I grow my audience is actually the wrong question for most podcasters. The existential question for so many of us is not how do I grow my audience, but why did my audience stop growing? Because often we ask, how do I grow my audience when we've hit a plateau, when we've hit a sticking point? And I would submit that asking why your audience stopped growing is actually the most important question to ask. And when you get your head around this question, you can very quickly see that the answer is not as simple as a lack of cross-promotion, or a failure to invest in advertising. I'll give you exhibit A here. Every quarter in Edison's podcast consumer tracker, we ask people how do they discover new podcasts and how they discover new podcasts most often. And every quarter, the answer that comes in either at number one or at least a close second is this one, recommendations from friends and family. In fact, in our most recent quarter two findings, uh, we had recommendations from friends and family tied at first at 23% with searching the internet, and then in third, social media posts at 15%. Now, improving your SEO can help with that middle response, searching the internet, and both cross-promotion and advertising can create awareness. But awareness is not trial. Weekly podcast listeners are already consuming just under seven hours per week of podcast content. And our overall time spent listening to audio is not increasing. So for me to listen to one or more new podcasts means I have to stop listening to something else, even if that something else is just peace and quiet. And the number one impetus to do that is when someone that you know, like, and trust tells you to take a chance on a new show. Now, there are many answers to the question, 
how can I grow my audience? But there is one simple answer to the question, why did my audience stop growing? And you might not like it, but here it is. It's because people stopped recommending your podcast. Now, there can be any number of sub-reasons why they do that, but I submit that they all roll up into this one, that your podcast is not easily recommendable. Now, you might think I'm overstating the power of organic reach here, but with social media, the number three way that people discover podcasts, to remind you, I can assure you that organic reach is more potent today than it ever was, certainly even more than it was five years ago, because our social networks are growing every single day. I mean, I suppose there is a theoretical limit to organic reach. Uh, if your podcast is in Icelandic, then the theoretical limit to your organic reach is maybe, I don't know, Iceland. But your podcast is nowhere near that limit. I can guarantee you that. From Sarnoff to Metcalf to Reed, all of the research done on networks, every time a new model for the power of a network emerges, it shows that the older models underestimated the power of a network. I think this is true with audiences. At some point, maybe you're recommended a podcast and maybe you'll consider it. If the person you recommend a podcast to has actually heard that recommendation from another person, it's then a much easier recommendation. And if three people recommend a podcast to you, you're going to listen to it, even if it's about, I don't know, fishing. You'll probably try it. You don't need to look any further for this than Netflix, which I'm going to bet you subscribe to for statistical reasons. Uh, there are a million shows on Netflix, but each season, we talk about one or two. These are the hits of the season. And the rest, well, they don't hit because people don't talk about them. For example, there are right now 11 Adam Sandler movies on Netflix, 11, and a bunch of them were made for Netflix originals like Ridiculous Six and The Do-Over and Sandy Wexler. You probably haven't seen any of these, but you might have seen Hubie Halloween, which despite its ridiculous premise and middling reviews, has been a massive global hit for Netflix, actually a genuine massive global hit. Same star, same shtick, but it became a hit because some cluster of nodes on the great network of life talked about it. In my keynote at Podcast Movement, I focused on the concept of recommendability, and I gave three things that I think every podcaster could do to improve their recommendability. Number one, know who you are for and why they are there. Number two, make your show easy to recommend. And number three, the hard one, master your craft. Now, the first point, know who you are for and why they are there, is really about understanding your audience, which even the casual listener to this podcast knows is generally my focus here. And the last point, master your craft, is all about making each show just a little bit better, a little bit tighter, a little more surprising and delightful than the last. And that's a practice, by the way. It's a craft, and it's not a gift. You can master it over time. But the biggest variable in the recommendability of your podcast is whether or not it's truly good, especially in comparison to the universe of content that people could be listening to. But today in our brief time together, I want to tackle the middle point, making your show easy to recommend. A podcast is actually not the easiest thing in the world to recommend, right? I mean, it's, it's not rocket surgery, don't get me wrong. But if I want to recommend a funny YouTube video, I'll just share it on Facebook or I'll share it on Twitter. The recommendation and the content come wrapped together in one easily digestible package. It shows up right in your feed and it plays natively right where you are, right along with my recommendation. This is why every stat I have ever seen for the percentage of people that have shared a video online puts that percentage into the 90s. And I can tell you, because we ask, this percentage for podcasts is, is quite a bit lower. I think that percentage is going to go up, however. And in fact, it's already going up. The more that we adapt to what podcasting has become today, the quicker we can influence that. One thing I think we can all do a better job with is creating shareable bits of our content. I don't think very many podcasts do a great job with this. Now, have you ever been to a supermarket or a deli and had someone offer you a sample? And I mean, this is before COVID destroyed samples and human contact and even some delis. Was that sample a small, thin slice of ham? Or was it a whole hawk on a stick? By the way, that's a million-dollar idea, hawk on a stick. I'm going to file that for 
my sub-premium mall food court idea. If your podcast is 60 minutes or even 30 minutes, you need to offer that little slice of ham every episode to make it easy to sample your show. Level zero of this is for podcasters to put more effort into their show notes, and many of you do that. Level one is to create a trailer, and many of you may have done that as well. But the next level of the maze, the key to unlocking the secrets of the deli, is to always be making samples. Don't leave it to your listeners to have to become audio editors. They won't do it. Isolate the best moments of a show and share them regularly. If you think your podcast doesn't easily break down into short beats or short moments like that, well, well, why doesn't it? I think you should challenge that received wisdom. This is what editing is truly for. It's not just for removing ums and ahs. When our content has been wrapped into a nice, easy-to-recommend sample, we also need somewhere to hawk our ham, pun intended. If I tell you to check out my podcast on Apple Podcasts and you're an Android user, or maybe a bitter ender who's still running BIOS on a 386 somewhere, I might as well have offered you an 8-track or one of my beloved trove of mini discs. The same, by the way, is true of Spotify. Even though Spotify is cross-platform, it does require an account, and for many, a premium membership to truly unlock its usefulness. But there are two places that I'm pretty sure I could send you to that I know would enable you to listen to my sample. The first of these is YouTube, and I've talked about YouTube a lot on this podcast. Uh, first, I want to give you an update on the importance of YouTube to the podcasting space. In our quarterly podcast consumer tracker data, and I'll provide a link to these graphs in the show notes, we ask weekly podcast listeners where they listen to podcasts the most. Here are the most recent results from Q2. Number one, Spotify at 24%. Number two, the Apple Podcasts app on iOS at 21%. And number three is YouTube at 18%. That's nearly one in five weekly listeners who say that YouTube is their primary service for podcasts. And by the way, this is why I twitch a little bit every time I hear a podcast end with, subscribe or follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Are you sure about that? Now, I've talked a lot about YouTube here, but there's something I'd like to double down on. YouTube is a fantastic content search engine. It may be the best content search engine. Now, you may have seen a funny video on any number of sites, but if I asked you to find it again, where would you go? We recently did an internal project for our friends at NPR that dove into YouTube podcast consumption in, in great detail, uh, and they have very generously agreed to allow me to share a little bit from that project, which uh, for which I and hopefully you are extremely grateful. So thank you, NPR. As a part of this project, we interviewed over 400 YouTube primaries. And a, a YouTube primary, as we define it, uh, is someone who says that YouTube is where they most often listen to podcasts. And we asked them a number of questions, including this one. Suppose you heard about a podcast that you were interested in listening to but did not know where to find it, where would you go first to try to find it? Well, 50% of YouTube primaries would go to YouTube first to try to find a new podcast. And by the way, the second answer here, another 30% would consult YouTube's big brother, Google. So that's 80% are actually going to a Google property first. But 50% say YouTube because people have an expectation that they will find your content on YouTube. And when they don't, it's actually a, a mild deterrent. YouTube is also the best content discovery engine. And if you're hearing the sound of my voice, you have watched a video on YouTube that you did not intend to watch. YouTube either suggested it or it just played it next and you liked it, be honest. Why shouldn't podcasters participate in that ecosystem and gain those benefits, even if only as a place for those carefully edited samples that I talked about? And by the way, this is what the number one podcast in America, the Joe Rogan Experience, does all the time. The full show is on Spotify, but clips of the best stuff every single day are on YouTube. Now, you may not have the resources to do this multiple times a day like Joe Rogan, but surely something will jump at you once a week from your show that's easily craftable into a delicious morsel of ham for the YouTube deli. Now, by the way, the question I am generally asked at this point is this, do I need to have video of the hosts or can I just have a still photo of the show 
with the sound of the podcast behind it? Well, you may not like the answer, but the answer is you greatly improve your odds with video. That's just a fact. But if the choice is between a still photo of the hosts versus not participating in the largest content search and recommendation engine, then get ready to say cheese. Now, there are many reasons why being on YouTube, however you choose to do it, is potentially a force multiplier for podcasts. And I'll highlight a couple of more here. Uh, Again, in the show notes, I'll link to the post with all of the graphs here. One of the questions that we asked is, what are some of the reasons why you listen to or watch podcasts most often on YouTube? And again, this was asked to YouTube primaries. And the percentages that we list there are a uh, percentage who ranked it in the top three. And the number one answer here was this. They're already there. They already use YouTube to listen to or watch other types of content. When you ask someone to try a new podcast, that's a behavior change. Asking them to also move to a different platform is just compounding the difficulty. YouTube primaries also tell us that it's just easier to use the service for podcasts and They're just used to using it for the other things that they watch and listen to. So again, why would they change for your show? By the way, my favorite reason is that for those who pay to subscribe to YouTube Premium, they just want to make the most of that subscription. And if you spend a lot of time on YouTube and you've hit your personal breaking point with those mid-sentence ad interruptions, YouTube Premium is, is very likely a rage purchase for you. So I can understand simply wanting to make the most of that investment. Uh, And about halfway down the list of the most important reasons why YouTube primaries choose YouTube is this. You can read comments or reviews posted by other users. That's recommendability. And this brings me to the second most important deli for podcasters to offer their delicious ham samples. And that's Facebook. A few months ago, I posted some research from our 2021 Infinite Dial study that we do every year with Triton Digital that detailed the social media networks people use the most. Today, amongst social media users, 47% say that they use Facebook the most often. It's not the majority, but it's still the plurality. Amongst monthly podcast listeners, that number drops to 36%. So 36% of monthly podcast listeners use Facebook the most and the rest, some combination of Snapchat, TikTok, Instagram, etc. But the point that I made uh, just a couple of months ago in this podcast was that while Facebook was waning in popularity amongst existing podcast listeners, it was still by far the number one social network with those who had yet to listen to a podcast. Amongst those who had yet to listen to a podcast, 60% say that Facebook is what they use most often. And there are a lot more of them than there are of you. Facebook's impending podcast integration, I think, represents an enormous opportunity to get your content, and again, ideally, short and entertaining samples of your content in front of people right where they graze. The ability to pass content along natively, along with your comment, along with your review, is potentially enormously important for podcasters. And again, being able to pass the recommendation and the content together in an easily digestible package that can be immediately or even automatically played in someone's feed is exactly what podcasting has not had enough of compared to video. Now, are these things possible now? I'm sure people will write in with ways to do this. But are they easy or accessible or well-known to everyone in your Facebook network? No, they're not. But when Facebook finally rolls out native podcast streaming in your feed, your podcast will have never been more recommendable, at least in terms of ease. And I'll close here with some data from last year. Uh, Earlier, I mentioned the list of preferred services used to listen to podcasts with Spotify uh, and First at 24%. Here's what it was one year ago in the Podcast Consumer Tracker. This is our Q2 2020 data. Number one, Apple Podcasts for the iOS at 25%, YouTube at 20%, and Spotify at 15%. In one year, Spotify has gone from 15% of weekly podcast listeners saying it's their preferred service to 24%. Just a year ago, Apple was the service most often used, and Spotify was in third, 
And in just 12 months, that's changed a lot. Now, for clarity, these data don't say anything about the number of podcasts consumed on either. These are percentages of humans. It simply says more people say Spotify is their preferred podcast listening service than, say, Apple Podcasts. Now, my point here is not that Apple has declined. In fact, the reality is that Spotify has surged and brought new weekly listeners into the fold, so the entire pie has grown. But my reason for sharing this with you isn't to talk about Apple or Spotify at all. It's to come back to where we started. This space can change very, very quickly if the audience wills it. That list of preferred services changed fairly quickly in a year because the audience willed it. Today, more people use Facebook and more people use YouTube than either Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And this space can change very, very rapidly if podcasters truly pump the gas on these two services. Too long? Didn't listen? You're making some great content. With the state of YouTube today and the tools that Facebook is about to make available to you, you have an enormous opportunity to fully release the brakes on being recommendable if, if you can adapt to those platforms and make it easy for their audiences to become your audience too. I'm Tom Webster. This has been I Hear Things for Friday, August 13th, 2021. Take care. We'll see you next time.